Hey everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Marcus Gosley. I'm the design lead at the Highway 1 Startup Accelerator. Highway 1 is a uh, hardware accelerator based in San Francisco. We look at about three or 400 teams twice a year and select 10 teams and we bring them into a very, very immersive environment where they work together. They work with a five-person engineering team alongside them who have expertise in design for manufacture. And then halfway through, we'll take them to China for 10 days so they get exposed to manufacturing at scale in China. And at the end, they pitch to VCs and press at the Haiwan Demo Day, and our last demo day was just last week. So typically, teams come in at this stage. They've, got, uh, they've taken advantage of the miracle of 3D printing and developer boards and actually gotten pretty far. Hopefully, they've, they've built a whole bunch of prototypes, put them out unsupervised into the lives of users, and are able to come to us and, and say, yes, this thing is definitely valuable. It definitely deserves to be made at scale. And then with the engineering and the design we mentioned, we work with them. And over 16 weeks, we'll, we'll do a whole bunch of engineering and design and help them get ready to, to look for outside financing. So I'll just do that again, it's pretty cool, right? Before, after. So those were six of the teams that graduated um, just a few months ago from Highway 1. Um, so hardware is awesome. I mean, it, it is, has potential for wide impact. It can solve different use cases, different users, different contexts. It, it, it multiplies the powers of, net, of network uh, computing when you can work with things that are not just a smartphone. Um, it has a really big cool factor. You can get people excited about what you're doing, you can hire people, you can get the press talking about you. Um, and it allows you to explore really interesting novel sort of business models that are a combination of physical product sales and subscription models and add-on, um, accessorizing, all this kind of stuff. And if you have a hit product, there's a potential to build a very high value business. Some of the biggest exits in the last 12 months or 24 months in the Valley were actual hardware exits like uh, Oculus and GoPro and people like that. Uh, but it's also an absolute freaking nightmare. You've got supply chain issues, you've got to make real stuff and move it around the world. You've got like, um, you know, parts being discontinued, you've got fulfillment, you've got inventory, you've, where do you keep this stuff in case people want it? And then if people don't like it and they send it back because there's a, there's a problem, you've got to do all the reverse logistics as well. And probably on top of that, you're building an app as well. The connected devices, all of the teams going through Highway 1 have this cool product and then they have an app as well. So they're, they're, they're everything that a software startup has to deal with plus all of this stuff. Uh, another really great, interesting challenge for hardware startups is the uh, temptation of Kickstarter. Kickstarter is amazing, it's, it's, it's changed the world, but it, it um, poses some unique hazards for the hardware entrepreneur. And um, when, when you fund on Kickstarter, you're not getting working capital, you're just getting a lot of pre-orders. And so you still have to have capital to develop the product. And so you're in this kind of interesting position. And you know, often you're, you're, you're crowdfunding before you really know enough to say what price the product will be and how, how long it's going to take to deliver it. So a million dollars is great, but if you owe people $1.2 million after you finish the production, it's not so good, right? Uh, and you know, like this is the, a real hallmark of, of Kickstarter. Is all of, every single hardware crowdfunding campaign you'll see will have these wonderful timelines that are based on the nothing could possibly go wrong kind of optimism where they'll say we're going to deliver by September. And some of these timelines are, are, are jaw-droppingly unrealistic in many cases. To, to go from design to fulfilling orders to people in less than a year is, is, is you know, not typical. Um, and you know, what you've got here is you've got early adopter customers that are really vocal, they're very social media savvy, and if you miss your deadline the world will know all about it. Uh, you know, managing risk is hard, but managing it with this sort of big deadline hanging over your head is even harder. And last but not least, Santa Claus. Like, another unique challenge for hardware is the seasonality of hardware retail. And um, there's a big pressure on, on entrepreneurs to make the Christmas season. And, you know, they can sometimes be forced into situations where they make commitments or make bad decisions and ship a product too early because of trying to kind of meet this demand around the holiday season. Um, you know, like the thing to say about hardware is that, you know, when you, when you see something, like this is where the rubber meets the road, or people, you know, posting their reviews online and saying, um, you know, this is awesome or this sucks. And if you look, like this was literally a random screenshot that I took from Amazon, and these people are talking about all sorts of stuff. They're not just talking about, did it work? They're talking about the friendly person and customer service. They're talking about the documentation. They're talking about tiny little details. And so, the amount of fronts that you have to fight on as a company to get those elusive five stars is much greater than with software. Um, 
So like, what does that mean? Like, um, we, when we think about bringing companies in and giving them the sort of guidance they need, we, we think about uh, product development in a certain way. Like basically over here on the left, what is a true statement is that when you're playing around with really rough prototypes, doing 3D printed stuff, you can move pretty fast and it's pretty cheap. As you go over to the right, the, the tools that you have to use because you're getting into mass production get slower and way, way more expensive. Um, this is not true for software. Software, you typically use very similar tools to explore, experiment around, and actually manufacture and deliver your product to your end users. Um, so, you know, what does that actually look like? That's a very kind of nice, clean, linear diagram. Like, isn't it wonderful you move to the left or right? It is getting more expensive, but it's all just a nice, steady pace. It's actually much more messy than that, of course. Lots of going back and forth and experimenting, and, and then you get into, like, okay, now that we think we're onto something, how are we going to actually make this beautiful? And then you might have to have some restarts, playing around with the trade-offs between design and is this manufacturable. You get into DFM, it gets messy again because you're starting to talk to real vendors that have certain capabilities and you have, might have to really go back and look at your design hard, hard again. And then, you know, lots of little starts and stops here and eventually, wonderfully, you get out to the market. And here's, a, here's one that went even smoother. You know, you went through here and you got out, had a few little loops here and you're eventually shipping your product. But, oh, you're getting completely your ass kicked on, out in the court of public opinion. And, you know, it's getting kind of too late to fix it at that point. And this is sort of a unique thing about hardware. Um, so what, what we have tended to encourage our teams to think about is rather than thinking about product development like those Kickstarter timelines as being, oh, isn't this wonderful, we're just gonna make our product, is that it's really, really awesome to hang out in a place where you can move quickly and cheaply. And you better be damn sure that you've got your, your stuff figured out before moving into the next most expensive, dangerous, slow moving part. And so, you know, these are the sort of uh, blocks, like, have you, do you understand even the people or the, the users you're building for? Have you actually proven that your, that your product can actually deliver value to people? That it isn't just sort of plausibly valuable, that it's actually valuable? Um, have you really learned what awesomeness is for your product in this particular market? And, and are you going to be able to delight, are you going to be able to get those five stars across your entire offering? And then, last but not least, how do you actually take this great vision that you have and do it many, many, many times over in an effective way with high yields, you know, and still make money doing it? And so, you know, these are sort of big existential questions that, that we encourage people to ask is do not rush through this. You have to really, really ask yourself, am I ready to go to the next stage? So I like to think about these as like fiery trenches of death where you've got to be really not in a rush to cross over them. And not to mention there's a whole bunch of dragons at the end that are very social media savvy and have strong opinions about great product experiences. Okay, so um, where are Highway 1 startups typically in this whole journey? So they are hanging out here. So we are looking for teams that are through the validation, they can say, look, here is evidence that we're building something that deserves to be made at scale. And they're, you know, they're sort of like getting into this idea, we need to design this, we need to figure out how to engineer this. And our sweet spot is actually really, really, they have rock solid evidence that this, they have product market fit, and they're at the point where they're, they don't have a lot of um, DFM or manufacturing scale experience, and we can really add a lot of value and take them to demo day and make them much more attractive to investors in a short space of time. So, so that's just a little bit of context for kind of our, our attitude to risk, you know, why this is so risky and how, how we sort of, I feel like, put the fear of God in our startups and say, don't be in too much of a rush to, you know, commit to a six month timeline and rush through the whole thing because guess what's going to happen at the end of that. And so what I wanted to talk to you guys about now is give you some examples of, of tools that people are using to manage that. And so I'm going to be talking for a little bit about investigations which are really scrappy, quick things you can do early on, asking yourself, am I even in the right business? Like, like, is this even a good idea? Instrumentation is just a couple of case studies of how teams have actually taken the time to um, not only do qualitative sort of assessments when they give the products to people, but also look at data and combine the two to figure out what's really going on. Uh, low volume manufacturing is um, a whole category here where I talk a little about sequential production, which is that 
point where every time you make a product, there's so much wrong with it that you're not gonna make multiple. You're just gonna keep making another one and changing a lot of stuff. And uh, batch production you start to do when you think, you know what, this thing is actually behaving itself fairly well. Now I need to make enough of them to give to a few people of different types, like different, different types of people so they can find different types of problems. And then outsource batch, batch production is when, you, when it gets to the point where you're still making low quantities, you're not ready to go to full mass production with injection molding and all these kind of expensive high setup cost processes. But you want to make enough to do a substantial, maybe even fulfill a beta Kickstarter campaign. And then last but not least, I'm going to talk about how some of our teams are getting great use of hacking existing products to, to create ex new, brand new experiences. So, um, investigations. This first team are making a robot that will cook your dinner for you. And they basically, it uses pre-prepared raw ingredients in these little packages that you load into the machine and it will then dispense those at the right time, at the right temperature, and it will stir the food and will, you'll then serve yourself dinner. Um, it's it's a, one of these deliciously crazy moonshot type hardware uh, projects and we took the team on because we like the guys and we thought, what the heck, let's see if we can help them make this real. Um, they had some really big existential questions like, like, can a robot actually cook tasty food? And, and what is cooking when it comes to automation? Um, will people actually want to eat food cooked by a robot? I mean, a lot, there's mixed, when you tell people this story, some people go, forget it, I'm not interested in that. And some people go, that sounds really neat. But they wanted to understand more about what that meant. And, you know, will, they, will it actually compete with other ways of feeding yourself, like ordering it in, or, or Sprig, or all these other um, services that are, that are growing about, you know, that, to solve that problem? And, so what was great, these team had already sort of gone and built a robot. What we encouraged them to do, they weren't able to talk in enough detail about what was really going on when a human chef cooked and what their robot was actually automating. And so we encouraged them to bring in chefs and to literally look at someone in very high level of detail what they were actually doing when they were cooking some, this is an Indian dish that a friend of mine actually cooked for them. And they, they um, you know, they're, look, they're literally looking at like, what is he doing? Is he, you know, how long, how long between adding the onions and then adding the spices and then writing up, you know, a script, if you like, of how do you actually script a recipe? And then they got into like, well, based on understanding, um, you know, the motions that the chef was making with his hand, how could we build a mechanism that could reproduce those different types of motions? And here you see really scrappy prototyping with foam core and bits of wood and whatever stuff is lying around. Um, Various, um, you know, increasing resolution of prototyping here, um, getting to something made with 8020 and some proper kind of automation gear, and they got to the point where they now they had a robot that could actually cook, and what they needed to prototype was the experience. And so they put the, their robot into the Highway One kitchen area and set up a menu and started uh, offering lunches to the other entrepreneurs in the space. And so, you know, very tweetable moments here. Everyone tweeting, I had my first uh, meal cooked for me by a robot. It was pretty, pretty much universal. Um, and then, you know, what, what, what people would, would pick a meal from the app menu, um, take the, um, the food that was you know, pre-prepared by the team, and, you know, they would cook, they would cook a meal. And the, 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 the point here was that there was a huge amount of rough edges in the experience, and they had to be around, they had to look at uh, what the people were doing, sometimes have to intervene. They'd wait for them to screw up and then say, okay, here's what you need to know, and then put post-it pads on the machine. They were basically hacking on the software, using text messages to sort of manage the kind of, hey, your meal is ready, come back and get it type stuff. And literally, like I said, hacking on the product itself, they realized people didn't know that the bottom tray, the tray was the first one. So they were putting the ingredients in in the wrong order and getting some very strange meals. <laughs> <laughs> so so they, they, you know, the, the point there is that these guys are, are, this is a huge, huge high risk project. You should not build a complicated cooking robot unless you know damn well what you're doing and you need to have actually, actually prototyped the experience and learned the whole time. And they're still on that journey together as a team. Um, this team, um, Censure, is a bunch of Canadians. I didn't know this about Canadians, but uh, no, these, these guys are, um, they're, they're, develop they're a bunch of students from the uh, University of Toronto and they're developing a really great product for helping elder care facilities manage incontinence, uh, basically the whole supply chain, if you like, of changing diapers on elderly people who, have, who can't control their bladders anymore. We'll all, we'll all be there. 
And so they, they, um, their investigation is they, they did a, a prototype as sort of a college um, a project, and they were like, you know, we, we build a prototype, but will it work in the real world with all the kind of messiness of, of the real world? And will all the different people involved actually see value in our product, and can we build a business from this? So they got out of the building and went on a big, long road trip out of, out of Canada, all over and visited 10 different centers, and got to kind of get a sense for how the places worked. Like, how do the shifts work? And what is it like to be a patient or to be a resident there? What is it like to be a caregiver? Like, there's a lot of turnover in the caregivers. How do the caregivers learn what to do? And they brought their um, the prototypes that they built back in the lab, and they were really asking questions about those, saying, you know, one of the things that they, they realized really quickly was that they had this really clever idea that it would be a two-part system. One would go inside the diaper, the other would be outside it. But a lot of the, the um, seniors had dementia, and they'd be just like, what's this thing? And they'd be tearing off, off. And they realized, like, wow, we need to make something that is completely unobtrusive and that the person wearing it doesn't realize that they're wearing it. Otherwise, they're going to be out of business if they try to make that product. Um, they needed, they need, the caregivers needed to be able to fit the device in, on a diaper in seconds, not minutes, because they're going around really quickly and taking care of lots of people. So they couldn't add any significant time to the routine of a caregiver. And that's not something that they, they thought about in the lab again. They realized that really fast out in the real world. And then also, like I mentioned, the turnover of caregivers was so high that they needed to, they needed to be able to train people how to fit these in, in a very short amount of time. And so here, here we see them making completely non-functional physical models of the, of the product just to validate whether or not they could create something that would not be detectable by the person wearing it. Um, so they're literally just like, they're putting on things that do not work and then just observing to see if anyone is trying to get them out of their diapers. And they took the knowledge from that um, and they also learned something really interesting in that when they were talking to um, the people running the facilities, there was this number of how much um, fluid should be in the diaper before it's changed. Um, and then they built a product that basically detected that amount of fluid. What they found out was that actually the number is really different. In the real world application, the caregivers know that that number would never work and they're operating from a completely different number. And so they had to actually redesign the, the sensor approach just to be able to deal with a different quantity of fluid. So these are the sort of things that would have literally put them out of business if they hadn't gone and got out, got out on the road and, and got dirty, but no, not a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> got their hands dirty, no. Um, was the fluid level higher or lower than what they thought? Um, I'm trying to think, it was, it was, it was more that, they, they it depended on the person. It depended on, like, it was more that um, some of the, of the patients were so upset about being woken up at night that they were, the caregivers were prepared to tolerate letting them go longer so they would only have to wake them up twice a night rather than three times. And so they were, they were working with, with understanding the actual human beings they were taking care of, not some kind of official number. Um, so they, they've incorporated um, a lot of these learnings and this is their current state of prototyping. I love this, um, this photo. The, the team were so embedded that here's one of them falling asleep on a shift. Um, and they also, of course, there was a big uh, software component where they were constantly iterating on what the dashboard needed to be. So you, you go from a, a scenario where you've got um, people going around just checking all these people and, 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 and waking them up, potentially changing diapers, maybe changing them too frequently, not frequently enough, to a situation where now you have a dashboard for every patient and you can see, oh, they're, they're because they, they fill up gradually. So it's like, oh, I need to go down and take care of Mrs. Jones. She's ready for, for changing. And so the, the people were really happy with it. And the patients said, this is, the quotes were, this is an amazing level of service. Because a lot of the patients are incontinent, but they're fully compassmentous. They know they're, they're st distressed by the situation they're in. And so anything that um, increases their dignity is a good thing for everybody. Uh, so the sort of tools that, uh, you know, we talked about the cooking robot, we talked about the incontinence. Um, that both of those um, were not about prototyping, great, I'm gonna go off and use the 3D printer and build a kind of Hollywood style prototype. They were, they were examples of actually prototyping cooking by getting someone to cook and watching them and doing, like trying to reproduce that. Part of that watching the cook was to get non-expert chefs to follow the same script and see if they could cook delicious food as well. Is it even reproducible? Or is there some ineffable magic that this cook is doing? 
So, you know, a lot of this stuff is about just saying, like, what assumptions do we have here and how is, what's the quickest damn way that we can figure them out? I think storyboarding is actually a very undervalued uh, form of prototyping because with a lot of these very complicated experiences where you have a wearable and a service and you've got relationships with people and you're trying to create an experience, it's hard to prototype that. But if you can write a story about someone having that experience, that's interesting and believable, that's actually a validation point for, for a product. If you cannot write a story about your product, which people hearing the story go, that's really cool, I, I totally see why she would have done that, that's actual, actually a data point. And so getting into like, this is the classic IDO sort of icon thing where they were able to like just tape together a film canister and a, and a, and a Sharpie and actually make a, a, a leap of insight with a tool for doing sort of scary sounding a head surgery. And so, you know, there's, there's all, the point I'm making here is this investigation stuff is about how, what is the absolute fastest way that I can figure something out. And you can even get into making working things with foam and cardboard and stuff like that. So, um, instrumentation, um, there's a couple of short case studies here. I think this is a very um, important part. I think that even in software, people aren't thoughtful enough about how to instrument their code. I think a lot of the time, instrumentation is, let's just put little calls all over the code and just count what's going on. And my belief is that what you have to have is you have to have a usage hypothesis. Like, if this thing is really valuable, we would see the following behavior patterns. And then what do we need to actually instrument in order to know whether or not those behaviors are happening or not? And so it's the same thing for, for hardware. Um, th these, this team were making a connected picture frame that allows me to put this, say, in my uh, parents' house and then easily send pictures of my kids to them. They don't have to be computer literate or techie. This stuff just shows up on their cool picture frame in their house. And so they, they were hacking on uh, iPad screens that they kind of scavenged from, from tablets and stuff like that. And they did a user trial. And this is sort of shows some of the progressions of their product from cardboard to slightly more highly resolved. They did a user trial of, of a, one of these guys in, in a bunch of people's houses. And you know the, the, um, the people that were receiving the photos from their relatives were so happy. They were like, this is the best thing ever. Like, you guys have totally nailed it. This is fantastic. But they had happily or luckily instrumented the, the product. And so they could see that people were turning the things off at night. They were literally powering them down and powering them up overnight. And so they went back to the people and said, look, you know, I know you said this was great, but why are you turning it off? And they're like, oh, because it, it glows in the, and it lights up the house in a weird kind of way and I don't like that at night, so I turned it off. And so and this was the sort of thing that they probably would have found, like I bet big money that this would have come up in Amazon reviews or it would have come up at some later point where they're going slower and it's more expensive. And so big, big, um, vote for just adding instrumentation just to kind of figure out what's really going on because people will tell you stuff but there'll actually be other stuff going on as well that they're not going to think to tell you. Um, these guys are, are a really great team uh, making a product for people that have uh, what's called body focused repetitive behaviors like hair pulling and skin picking. You, you might see sometimes people with patches of hair missing they have this unconscious habit of just like pulling little bits of hair out and over time they literally will have no eyelashes and stuff and so um, you know things like uh, nail biting and various other things are sort of cousins of these of these disorders um, so they they um, they were like you know how can we actually um, fix this how can we create a product that can help people with this condition is very very uh, it's it's not a, it's a condition that the people who suffer from it are really not happy having um, so they were like, well, what, what if just raising the awareness of when my hand is in a certain position would, would actually do that? Now, instead of going off and getting an accelerometer and getting all super fancy high-tech, um, they built a, a very simple prototype with a, two bracelets, one of which had a bell, so that every time the co-founder actually suffers from this condition, every time she raised her arm, she'd get a little jingle of the bell. It was super, like it didn't work that great, but it, it got, it increased their confidence that awareness was something that could really help. So that, that gave them enough um, motivation to go and build a, um, a, a prototype using an off-the-shelf Metaware development kit. So the Met Metaware is a development kit that's optimized for helping with various wearable types of, so it has power management and various things that wearable people care about. And they were able to use that standard um, product to make something that could be worn for longer periods of time, that was less obtrusive, wasn't like a bell ringing on your arm. 
And they were able, to, the question was like, does this awareness value decrease over time? Do you just become kind of known to it and then you keep kind of doing your habit? And they were able to prove to their own satisfaction that actually having this thing on you for an extended period of time did really help, that people didn't get used to it. Um, and through that actual um, uh, prototype, the co-founder was able to make a really, really substantial progress with kicking this habit that she's had for a lot, for all of her life. Um, now, the thing is that this was not a, an overnight thing. This took many, many months for, for her to have this level of success. And so instrumentation was really, really important for them to know whether they were on the right track or not. And so they were able to correlate um, times when she was wearing the device with, with, with um, various types of forms of success and actually come up with an argument for themselves and also people they talked to that this is actually a real potential solution to the problem. Um, that um, got them to the point where they decided to invest in custom hardware that had a better um, accelerometer that was more optimized for what they were trying to do and had some other attributes that were, you know, the, the generic hardware metaware is fantastic for everything, but sometimes you need to go custom to do things for your particular project. Um, I think it was battery life and accuracy. And then um, in one of the, this is always a good idea is to go to a trade show with people that are in your target market and try and sell them stuff. And so they, they were just came from one of these trade shows a couple months ago and, and out of all of the attendees they actually got 51 pre-orders. So um, we're, we're um, talking them at the moment and I really like the team and I hope we end up accelerating the highway one in, in the spring uh, session. Um, so like how do we, how do you actually instrument hardware? Uh, one of the easiest ways to do it is to use development boards that have like cloud connection just built into them. So this is, um, this is not a plug for any particular company, but I, this is an example of a product by um, Particle, which is called the Photon, and it basically has a cloud platform that comes with it. And so you can literally, um, you know, in, in, the, in your code on, on the particle, you can just say publish the, that variable name and that value and do it every two, uh, every two seconds. And off you go, you basically have a temperature sensor and the stuff, the data just starts accumulating in the cloud. And then their, their cloud service has a REST API, so whatever other code that you're basically writing can start to consume that information. So it's not hard to actually, with these connected devices, to actually do this sort of a database stuff. Um, if, you're, if your device isn't connected, uh, all the time to a network, it's sort of intermittently connected. Another strategy is to just, you know, on your dev board is to solder in a little 75 cent memory chip and just send values to it intermittently that you can then pull off that whenever you connect it back to your computer. And, you know, you can also use an SD card or a USB key that easily can be removable from the device and you can put it in your computer and pull the log files off. Um, a friend of mine, one of the guy engineers at Highway One, was, uh, Ryan, was telling me that he worked in a in a, a product for long distance truck drivers a few years ago, and their solution was there was a USB key that was really uh, accessible on the product, and a trucker with big hands could just grab it, stick it in an envelope, and mail it back to them. And so they would send them an envelope with a new key, and then the trucker would send it back, and so they had like regular data coming back from their truck product all the time. Um, so moving on to the next category of, 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 sort of how do you start to make um, multiple copies of, of what you're doing. Um, first of all, like I mentioned earlier, sequential production is when every single thing you make has so many problems that the next one you make is going to be totally different from it. It's early on, it's when you're getting rid of all the real glaring problems with it. Um, so this is a case study of Switchmate, which is another Highway 1 company. They were making a device so that you can just, in a matter of seconds, cl click this using magnets onto a switch and now it connects to your, your auto home automation system and you can be part of your kind of rules of your house. And basically they, they said, you know what, we're going we're gonna to sell this stuff right out the gate. So they, they put together a Facebook ad campaign and they, they, they got a bunch of customers and they, made, they 3D printed um, the product called them up and said, hey, by the way, this is a beta program and we'll, look, we'll keep sending you updates to make sure that managing their expectations. And this is the products about to be shipped off to their first five customers. They're 3D printed, all of the circuitry in it is like handmade and everything, but they're, learned, they're gonna learn an awful lot. So what they did learn was people come back to their houses with stuff in their hands all the time. That's what we do, we bring stuff into our houses. And when they would get in, they wouldn't be able to get out the light switch because their clever product was in, was in the way of the light switch. And they're like, oh. okay, well, we wouldn't, couldn't have predicted that. So what we'll do is, 
3 designer will integrate a switch under the front of it so that the switch isn't hidden, you have a new switch that you can touch. So they did another Facebook campaign. Uh, again, slightly fancier design here. And what was interesting was rather than actually sending out much more pretty design, they again called up the people and said, hey, thanks a million, by the way, there's a beta program, would you be okay if we sent you one with this switch rather than the other? And the people were like, oh, you guys are great, no problem, we'll, we'll, we'll just, we'll try this out. Again, you gotta never assume that certain types of fit and finish are actually important at this stage. It may not be important at all. And when a nice guy's calling up on the phone and telling you how entrepreneurial they are, anything goes. And so they were able to send out um, 3D printed boxes with like a tiny cheap switch just stuck on the front of it. And there it is, that's the package is going off again. And what they found here, uh, among other things, was that the magnet attachment needed to be stronger, that the product was starting to get a bit heavier, and that you know, one story was that a spider had shown up and the lady had battled at it and the switch went flying, and it, 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 the magnet needed to be stronger and the casing needed to be strong, of course. So they were able to also, um, they had feedback where people were saying that when I'm trying to turn the, the switches on and off my phone, it, it, it gets confused, so they knew that they needed to make much more you know, larger, uh, you know, button areas for their app eventually when they got it all nice and shiny looking. And in parallel with that, they were, they were doing an awful lot of prototyping in their own lab with various types of switches and everything where they were also discovering other issues. Um, and then these guys did a reasonably good Kickstarter campaign um, you know, just a few months ago. And they, you know, they'd already done uh, several rounds of manufacturing and, and the debugging and catching things that could have easily become serious problems for them when they would really ship a manufactured product. This team here are uh, making a really cool sort of um, massaging uh, sleeve for recovery after athletic efforts. Um, it's a kind of fancy two-part thing where you've got a compression stocking and then this uh, thing that wraps around it and actually squeezes in a, in a pattern and actually pumps uh, blood in and out of your legs to increase uh, recovery. And this is a proven approach. These are kind of crazy expensive unwieldy products that top athletes use uh, all the time to do this, but you know, you, you have to have money and, and be prepared to get into a crazy apparatus like this. And so they're working on a product that does the same thing, but it's like that. Um, just a little bit of a, again, a little bit to give you a bit of a sense of well, how did they get there. They did a ton of, um, you know, prototypes to figure out how it would go on and how this would actually work, how the effect would be achieved. Um, here's some examples of stuff. A lot of hand sewing, a lot of uh, basically these are handmade like craft objects to basically to, to explore whether this product would actually work or not. And there is actually their first working prototype. So you can see that there's waves of contractions going up. And so it's, it's literally doing the same thing as the larger bulky unit but in a very slim profile. And this is again a handmade product that they literally made by themselves. Um, so you know they're getting into more refinements of that, and they were able to make like a whole bunch of these by hand and give them to people for extended periods of time and learn a whole ton of stuff about whether the product worked, what they needed to do when they actually got into serious design, and they learned they got they learned a few new uh, skills as well. They got extremely good at sewing. <laughs> um, so this this you know like really I want to paint a picture here of like when you're at this stage of, of development, it's it's, it's like this eclectic mix of skills where you're, one, you're doing 3D printing, you're, you're getting rid of the support material, you're starting to hand make stuff, you're soldering, you're testing, and you might be even out the back of a spray can just to make manufactured products that feel something like a, a mass-reduced product but allow you to test and find problems early on. Um, you know, here's, here's um, you know, and this is sort of, uh, again, what I was saying is it's suited, this sort of techniques are where every, it's very laborious, like if you, were to add it up, it probably could be a thousand dollars to make a product that you will end, end up retailing for fifty dollars. But the value of the stuff that you learn is very high, and so it's it's optimized for times when every project you produce is different. And you know, basically every version you get new learnings that you incorporate each time around. So what are the kind of tools they use for that? Obviously, three D printing is a big part of that. Um, you test. You test and redesign during the day, you put a print on at night, and then you come in the next day and it's there and you clean it off and then you keep working on it. And so there's this lovely cadence of being able to work on something, come in the next day, keep going. Things that in the past you'd have to send out to a prototype shop and it would have sort of broken your rhythm. Um, 
you know, one of the other things I would say about 3D printers is that they're not magic. They're, 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 um, to get one that can do reasonably quality, reasonably good quality things is five, like these are $5,000 typically, maybe a little bit lower than that now, and they do very small parts, very fine, and then this one over here can make objects about that size, but they're still, you know, they don't actually look like an injection molded part. And there's an awful lot of babysitting going on. Like, like when we're running these, there's people going in all the time going, oh, the filament needs to be re reloaded, or there's something wrong. Like, or, or even just random stuff happens where you come in and the thing is just a big glitch in the middle, then you've got to throw it out and start again. So it's still a technology that's sort of starting to, it's still um, maturing. Um, another really big favorite with our teams is the laser cutter. These are pretty affordable uh, products, and they're very, very versatile for cutting fabric and different types of adhesive films and you know, ply, thin plywood and stuff like this. And like what I was talking about before, you've got the sewing machine and the other mill is a desktop mill, which is fantastic. And it, it came out as a, like a mill and they, they talked about how you could mill all these different metals, but what's, how it's really taken off is as an alternative to doing etched printed circuit boards. Because you can actually mill the traces of a circuit in a, in a, on, a, on, a, on a photosensitive or a PCB, which has a copper layer. And in a very short amount of time, you can be you know, soldering components on that and building like subsystem prototypes for your electronics. And so the other mill has really come into its own for, for prototyping circuit boards. Um, and you know, teams also rely, like I was saying earlier, are heavily on, on development boards for their prototypes. So this is a, a product that helps people adopt new healthy habits. It's called Moti. And the lady who's developing it is using, uh, again, the particle Photon. I don't have shares in that company, honest. And and and, but she will not have that in the product when it goes into mass production. She will have to re-engineer the internal workings of the product to use components that are affordable. That's a twenty dollar um, twenty dollar module, and everything goes like four to five x. So that would that would be a hundred dollars just for that at, at scale. So by the time the retailers and everyone is taking their cuts, so what you have to do when you're doing the mass production, you re-engineer everything when you know that you're building the right product. But for this stage, it's fantastic, because for $20, you've got a cloud-connected thing that you can program and try out loads of stuff. And a lot of the, um, the developers that are, that are doing various types of boards are more than happy to give you these fancy dev kits, maybe two or three of them, even for free, because they're hoping that you'll come back and order tens of thousands from them when, they're, you know, when you're doing mass production. And so many entrepreneurs can take advantage of this and get like, you know, three or four of these dev kits for no money and actually get pretty far with those three kits just by going around and being nice to sales reps and stuff like that. Um, so batch production, this is where it gets kind of interesting because this is where you want, where you, um, where you know, you're, you're certain enough about your product that you want to make more than one of them and give it to a bunch of people because you feel like you've gotten rid of most of the really glaring, glaringly obvious issues so now you've got to get, put it in different contexts and see what else you discover. Um, so the, this uh, case study here is uh, Fishbit. They're, they're, it's like fish, Fitbit for fish. <laughs> and, uh, what it does is it, it, um, managing a saltwater aquarium is really tricky because there's all sorts of levels, like there's, there's temperature, there's a salinity, there's different kind of nitrates and God knows what in there that can actually hurt your fish. And it's, it's very opaque. You look at it and you're like, it looks fine to me. And then the fish are floating upside down on the surface. So. This actually gives you, they have a few sensors in the tank that will give you sort of high, le high level indicators about whether your tank is healthy or healthy. They call it happy, if your tank is happy or not. Um, so it's all about like saving fish's lives and allowing um, tank owners to, to be more creative and have more peace of mind when they're trying out new things in their, in their aquarium. And it goes in, you know, the, the big part goes in the tank, the small part is on the outside and they connect together with magnets and there's an induction uh, power and induction data transfer between the two. And so it's really high tech and the fish people love it because the existing solutions are very kind of nerdy, there's wires everywhere. And then also they've taken some sort of you know, cool West Coast app design philosophy in here and created a really nice looking app for it. So they did their, they did their um, they kind of paid their dues on the 3D printer making many, many, many of these. And then at a certain point they're like, yeah, we, we've got a product that, that we, the people want that we're happy with, and so we're going to we're going to do a Kickstarter campaign, and we're going to basically get. Um, okay, I'm going to show that. Anyway, there was a Kickstarter campaign. So, so what they did was they they set about the process of doing um, silicone silicone molding of the part, which is 
the thing about 3D printing is it takes about three or four hours to make one. So if you're going to make 50 of them, that's weeks of time. So what you need to do is switch to a process where you can make a lot of things more quickly. And silicone molding is a fantastic process for that. What that requires is that you make one really nice version of your product in metal or in a hard material using CNC mill. And then you make uh, silicone molds of that, um, those objects. And they had four plastic parts, so there's four molds. Um, then you, you know, mix this sort of um, uh, urethane uh, resin, and the mold is there waiting to be, uh, to be poured. And there it is, the mold has been separated, and this is the uh, product coming out. So if you really get into this, you can, you can be cranking out like enclosures of your product. And it takes about five to 20 minutes, five to 20 for, the, for this to cure. And so you can get a good little production line, uh, line going to make 50 or 100. Now it's not so interesting if you want to make thousands of them. Um, they, you know, a lot of this then required them to sort of hand, hand assemble the, the, the electronics. And a big part of this also is testing. You need to do burn-in tests. Um, you want to be like really making sure that everything's working because you're sending these things out. And you're learning a ton here to how, how do you actually make more than one of the things. You're learning how to reproduce stuff, which is different than make, learning how to make a thing. And a lot of that learning can, can be relevant to further down when you're getting into mass production. These guys did the casting themselves, but a lot of teams will actually uh, contract this out to um, short production mold facilities who, do, who are very good at doing silicone cast and molding. And this team actually did contract out the cert, um, PCBA, the P printed circuit board assembly for their product. So here you see stuff coming um, back from a local Bay Area um, PCBA plant. And you can see their, their power management stuff. And a nice picture, again, the, the obligatory picture of boxes being shipped out to uh, hopefully happy customers. And they had a really nice um, unboxing experience. Again, all this is sort of handmade where they printed this stuff themselves. But again, they get to play around with what's it like to open the box and see the product for the first time. Great, so um, um, what, what does this look like? Uh, like, like if, if 3D printers are so awesome, you know, why aren't we using them? I kind of talked about this before, but let's get into some details on that. So 3D printing, um, you know, there's no real setup costs apart from the CAD that you're doing. And it's, really, it's reasonably modestly, like the filament all costs maybe for one of those parts we just saw is about 20 bucks or thereabouts. But it, it, it has poor finish quality and low repeatability. Like every time it comes out, there might be slight differences, and that's not good when you're making more, more than one of something. And there's a definite investment in the machine, and it takes a bunch of time to produce one of them on a machine. Um, compare that with injection molding. Now, injection molding is how all this plastic stuff that we own is made. It's, you, build, you invest a lot of money in building a very, very complicated tool, and then molten plastic is pushed into it, and these things are popped out at a very high rate. Now, the, the thing about injection molding is it's absolutely horrible. Like, you've got huge setup costs. Like, even the simplest tool, that block of steel is the tool. A relatively simple one of those is like 30 grand, and it's a very skilled job. And so you can't iterate. Like if you're putting down 30 grand to make one of these things, you can't kind of, oh, I want to change this, I want to change that. You've got to know what you're doing. And the lead time can be very long, up to six weeks. So you, you have to factor that in when you're trying to ship things out. Now the great thing about injection molding is that once you've done all that and provided you actually have the right design, you can crank these things out like bam, 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 at pennies on the dollar. And so that's why we have injection molding. It's horrible, but great at that. Um, so this is another shot of the urethane casting. You've got, you, can, you can create quite complicated parts. Um, and what, it, what you could say for urethane casting is that um, like really low setup costs. Like you're, you're literally just milling one part out of you know, a or something that's easy to work with. So therefore, you get low iteration costs. If you do actually make 10 of these things, you put them out and you realize, oh crap, the button's in the wrong place. It's, not prohibitive to just machine a new master, remove the button, and off you, you just keep going. Um, short lead time is always good. And another thing to mention is that the sort of things you have to be thinking about when you're doing an urethane molding are getting you to start thinking in the right way for when you eventually get to injection molding. The only problem with this is the high unit cost because it's a very manual process. But for low volumes, uh, because of low setup cost, the math just works out. Even if you're paying $50 for one of those enclosures and you might be losing money on your Kickstarter beta campaign, 
the, it's really about the knowledge that you're getting back. Um, so it's perfect for low volume production. Here's another nice shot of cast stuff. Um, I'm going to use this as another example for the for the electronics that go like typically almost every product that you um, that our startups are making involves like some kind of PCB printed circuit board and electronics and some kind of enclosure. Typically, it'll eventually be done in plastic. So this is the other the other most common type of thing that you need to be making in a batch form. So this product here is a is a board that one of our startups is producing, and. Um, you know, it makes sense at the beginning to build a few by hand, and but then it is very labor intensive. So the thing to do is to send it out to a local PCBA plant in the Bay Area. Um, and why why local? Um, China is everyone talks about China as being the this manufacturing powerhouse. But the thing about it, and you can actually, I, I took the time to get the real numbers for you here. So that board costs for quantities of fifty to hundred about fifty dollars for printing the board, the components, and actually assembling the board. In China, the same product typically would be in the range of $15. Um, but because we're talking about low volumes here, just the overhead of having to deal with a different time zone, people may not speak English completely perfectly, and potentially having to go over and kind of supervise the job. It, it actually makes sense to do low volume production here in the United States, um, for sure. So all the teams we've been talking to are looking at solutions around making stuff in low volumes to really iron out the bugs here in, this, in, in the United States. And then when their quantities get up to a certain, the demand goes and they know we've got to make a bunch of these and we know what we're making and we know it's good and we've got happy customers, then it makes sense to go and do all that investment in tooling and everything over in, um, in China. Great, so last but not least, I love this category, uh, hacking existing products. Um, first case study here is a company called Magic Instruments. They just graduated from Highway 1 just last week. And their goal is to help you be a rock star. <laughs> and how are they going to do that? And um, you know, this, this is this I just stole half his deck. Um, this is the dream, or else if this is the dream. But the problem is this part. So as Brian, Brian Fan is a great CEO of this company, and he says that the guitar as we know it has a 300 year old UI dictated by the physics of vibrating strings. I love that. And so what he's saying is, if, you know, the reality is that 90% of people, everyone wants to play the guitar, but they give up. And so what he wanted to do is, anyone can play it? Great new UI. Put it, making it smart, and then you get musical superpowers. <laughs> so this is pretty, this is a pretty big claim, right? Like he's really putting himself out there, right? This has got to be good. How is he going to prototype this? Like a completely new guitar, so what he did was, he got on eBay, and he cornered the market in this discontinued 90s product from a uh, manufacturer who should not be named. Now what it is, is it's a guitar that has buttons instead of strings, but its goal was to teach you how to play the guitar, and teach you about chord shapes, and light up the buttons in different ways, so you go, oh, that's a C, or that's a G, and then you'd get a real guitar, and you'd be off to the races, and so it was a, like, a, like a training wheels for your guitar. And so they, you know, they, he basically, every time any one of these went on sale, he, he was the guy that was driving the prices up. Uh, so this is, this is what it looks like you know, when you take it out of the box. So you open it up, I mean, you've got your, your brains and you have some basic bits and pieces here, some wires going up to the buttons on the fingerboard. And what they did was they, they basically uh, just circumvented all this stuff here, put two Arduinos in there. One, one Arduino was looking at well, what button is being pressed. And this other Arduino had a sample library and was saying, oh, I gotta play this guitar note or that guitar note. So that, what that meant was that they did a speaker upgrade, they put in an amplifier, they put two new brains in it, and the only thing they used that was in the electronics before were the, were the little sensors for the strings that you plucked because they were a really dedicated piece of hardware. And so this is a, an example. He was able to, like, in, in a matter of, you know, a short amount of time hack on this guitar and actually go and validate whether his, it was more fun or was easier to play the guitar. And what, what the child here has to do, this is my daughter actually, what the child here has to do is just hold down uh, one um, button instead of an entire chord. And so they're able to literally um, you know, sing along and say, oh, I have to hold down the first button. And I have to keep strumming, and now, now I have to hold down the sixth, sixth button. And if you're holding down a button that's further up, it's like a six slash two, which means the sixth fret, the second button. And so what they're really doing here is they're saying, what if you didn't have to learn all these shapes, but you just had to know which button to press? Would that be fun? Now, if they didn't go and hack on these guitars, it could, it could have taken them 
a whole bunch of time. They, they did tons of user testing with this and, and learned just loads and loads about what the product needed to be. It's kind of like a random <laughs> flying in the back of an eagle, you know? It's, or it's like open source for hardware. And you know, as they actually uh, learn things, they're slowly but surely replacing pieces of the original hardware with new hardware. So that's in the new uh, button uh, board where some of the buttons are different heights so that you can actually locate them better. And this is a quote from Brian, great CEO, and he's just saying he probably saved a year. Um, so I'm a huge fan of this. I think that you could almost say in the same way that a software developer might decide what product project to work on because of the availability of open source libraries. I'm sure it happens. I can predict that a smart hardware CEO will say, well, I've got these two ideas, but, and one of them I can actually get really damn far by buying this product and chopping it up and changing it, and the other I would have to build things from scratch. Like, that's kind of like maybe a reason to pick that idea, because you can find out quicker if you're wrong, if you're in the wrong business. These guys um, have a product shipping in, the, uh, in Amazon right now with really good reviews. It basically helps kids avoid having nightmares by... Uh, it seems kind of crazy, but it's based on super uh, rock-solid research, and they have amazing uh, customer testimonials, and it just works. So they needed to create, um, part of their solution needed to gently wake a child up. So they went and they found this alarm clock for people that have trouble with regular alarm clocks, who sleep too heavily. And they were, this is a vibrating <coughs> puck that goes under a mattress, and they were able to say, we're gonna use that in our product. So they, they bought one of those, they kind of prettied it up a bit, put a brain and a Bluetooth thing that connects to your phone in between the power supply and the, the vibrating thing, and, and did some really nice uh, documentation and out-of-box work. So it's a really nice experience for the people getting it. There's a little character with stories. And you know the team are great. This is them packing off uh, products. Remember that, that the heart of this product is a thing they bought from someone else. And they're actually reselling it. Like they're, they're not just prototyping. They're actually building a business, phase one of their business, by hacking on and reselling a product that was already for sale it for another use. And with fantastic results, like these, these parents who were freaking out because their kid was like possessed, and now they're not, are, are loving everything about these guys, and they don't care whether the thing in the middle of the product is a custom manufactured product, they just care whether it works or not. So these guys, I think, are a fantastic example of just saying, don't get seduced by, oh, it has to be this, but how can we actually get out there and prove that we're building something valuable as quick as possible? And you know, they have some lovely designs that they've been working on, but they're gonna wait until the volumes go up in order to justify doing custom manufacturing of those designs. And what are the sort of you know, tools for that? You know, the tools for that are the world of retail, a glue gun, a Dremel, and a bunch of wires and stuff, whatever you can come up with. If you're looking, trying to create an experience, the creative creativity is seeing something in the world that allows you to take a shortcut to that experience. So, thank you all. Um, I hope those were uh, some, I hope that got with some food for thought. <laughs>